Next we have Mary Wilson, who is here from Newtown. Mary helped co-found the uh, Newtown uh, branch of Protect Our Pollinators, which is an organization that works to obviously protect the um, native environment so that we can have more pollinators. Um, she was on the Conservation Commission for seven years in Newtown. She has a degree in education and in chemistry and a master's in management. Um, she loves to ski and jog, right? And what was the other thing? Garden, right? <laughs> and she obviously is passionate about pollinators. Um, she and Holly Cosette, who's also here, won an award at this year's 2018 uh, Connecticut Flower and Garden Show. Uh, was it a silver or was it a, a silver award for their Protect Our Pollinators presentation? So, welcome up. So, wasn't that great to have the farm perspective? I love that. I think that was um, just right on. Any, are there any other farmers in the group here? Uh, any lawn care professionals? <laughs> any homeowners that have grass to take care of? <laughs> All right. So, we're going to start with pollinators. Our future is tied to theirs. And it sort of implies that there's a connection between us and pollinators. And it turns out that it's not just that connection, but everything is connected. So you've got your pollinators and your birds and your soil and the soil bacteria. And what are they saying? That one teaspoon of good soil can have up to a billion um, microbes and, and soil bacteria in it. So that's something we don't think about very often. And then you have your insects and you have your, your, um, your trees and your bushes and your waters. So if you take all those components and put them into a, a scene like we might see here in Connecticut. It might look like that, but what's missing is the little things you don't see. You don't see the saw microbes, you don't see the insects, you don't see the um, macro invertebrates that might be in the water. So I think we have to keep in mind the small things because we can impact those greatly um, by our actions. And all these things have co-evolved together to work as part of a healthy whole. And this is part of biodiversity that we just heard about. And they work together through check, checks and balances. So bees are, I think, are probably one of the most important parts of an, uh, an ecosystem. And they're a keystone species because they are necessary for a 75 or maybe 80% of plant life. And all that plant life provides habitat for other species. And even though they're so important, it turns out that they may be facing extinction. And in 2016, there was a UN report, these butterflies and other pollinators face extinction. And what it said was, many species of wild bees, butterflies, and other pollinators are shrinking towards extinction, and the world needs to do something about it before our food supply suffers. And I would say that it's not just our food supply, but whole ecosystems that support all kinds of life, not just uh, our food supply. Uh, bee populations are down, and you can see the graph there from 1947, and I think part of that is habitat loss, some of it's pesticides, um, some of it's other issues that bees have. Um, two, two types of bees, and you may know this, but there's honey bees, and those are the ones that we keep for honey, and they're managed bees. And then there's native bees, and we think that native bees kind of are the forgotten stepchildren because they don't have people that are you know, taking care of them per se. And they are re responsible for a lot of the pollination services that, um, that go on. So there's bumblebees, mason bees, carpenter bees. And I think an important thing is that all bees are hairy. They're designed to pick up pollen. So because they're hairy, they have to pick up other things along the way like pesticides and chemicals. Uh, of the native bees, there's generalists, and those bees will be out throughout the whole growing season. A bumblebee is a, is a generalist. And then there's many, many specialists. There's over 350 species of native bees in Connecticut, and most of those you probably never even will see because they're specific for a certain plant, a certain flower that has, you know, I don't know, two or three weeks worth of um, activity. And 70% of our native bees have home, homes underground, and that's really important when we think about spreading things on our lawns and on our play, play fields and other places. 
So there's a number of stressors that bees face. One is pesticide exposure, um, and I think habitat loss is a huge one. There's just more and more development in our, our area towns as time goes on. We're just losing all those those meadows, and then and sometimes the meadows are growing up into forests. So land that used to be available to pollinators is shrinking. And what happens is that of all these problems that the bee has, bees have many of them influence the other stressors. So you've got bees that maybe have poor diet because of lack of habitat, and those bees are going to be more suspect to varroa mites or more suspect to, to pesticides, which sort of makes sense. We know that as humans, if we don't eat right and take care of ourselves, we're more apt to um, fall prey to other um, diseases and other stressors. So how do bees contact pesticides through direct contact? Um, and pesticides from clouds from treated seeds. A lot of farmers will have treated seeds um, so that they're coated and when they go into the fields to um, plant them, this dust comes up and it, it really uh, spreads. And it's a, it's a large percentage of, of the coating that gets airborne. And you have contaminated water and you've got contaminated pollen which um, is back in the hive so that the baby bees are affected as well. Honeybees, it's interesting, they will go for three to four miles from home. So in the course of a day, they may go many distances and they may pick up a pesticide here, one pesticide here, another one here. So they may be subject to a wide variety of, of chemicals. Native bees stay closer to home, but still, um, you know, the lawn care products that we use, the garden chemicals and those things may affect them. And again, the ground dwellers, um, we have to be aware of what we're spreading on our lawns. Um, this is a law of unintend unintended consequences. It's when we identify some problem that we have in our garden or in our lawn, and so we, we get out the big hammer, we get out something, some broad spectrum pesticide or herbicide that we think is gonna take care of the problem. And what we don't realize is that we may be harming other organisms besides what we're trying to um, target. And that could be other plants, it could be your soil microbes, water resources, insects in general, and the beneficial insects specifically that we just heard about that are really the, the protectors of our crops. Um, it could be the birds and other wildlife that could be affected. And beyond that, there's something called synergy, and we have learned that many pesticides, when they're mixed with other pesticides or herbicides, actually become more toxic than they would have been on their own. So you have an effect where two and two makes five. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, that, that's not being tested for. That's just sort of something that happens um, in real world. And then you have breakdown products as uh, pesticides degrade. Some of the resulting products are toxic or maybe even more toxic than the original compound. And many products have inactive ingredients put in them. Um, so to maybe make the product stick to the leaves more, but some of those have toxic characteristics as well. This is really important, I think, for us to remember that the testing for bees, the way it's done is they, they're looking for acute or deadly effects of the bees, and they have something called the LD50 where half of the dose, half of a population dies, um, but they don't test for chronic effects. So, and, and bees will have chronic effects. They, sometimes they will get disoriented. They'll, uh, not, they won't be able to communicate properly. Maybe they don't um, lay as many eggs. Um, also, testing is usually done by the manufacturer of the chemicals. So, you know, they may, they may have a, um, an ax to grind. <laughs> and the testing is done on adult honeybees only. And we know that honeybees are perhaps, um, better to withstand stressors than the native bees are just because of the way they um, because of the, they have greater numbers and they they work together and it's the native bees that may be more at risk and also they're not testing for the young bees or the brood of what's happening what's happening and um, so the testing is not done in in the real world situation and 50 years ago, Rachel Carson knew this, and she wrote, by their very nature, chemical controls are self-defeating, for they have been devised and applied without taking into account the complex biological systems against which they have been blindly hurled. The chemicals may have been pre-tested against a few individual species, 
but not against living communities. So, you know, the testing can be done in the laboratory. You know, you got one chemical, one, one B with certain criteria, and, but it's not the real world. <clears throat> There's been a lot of the news lately about neonicotinoids, which I will call neonics um, from here on out because it's easier to say. Uh, it's similar in structure to nicotine and they're used to control things like aphids, whiteflies, and grubs. Um, the names, I'm, we're not gonna expect you to remember those, but if you take out one of our business cards on the back table there, it has the, all the names around the back of that. And all of these, um, Neonics are toxic to bees. Some are more toxic than others, but they're all toxic. <clears throat> and this is, the reasons that they're bad is because they're systemic and they become incorporated into the whole plant and then it's expressed in the pollen, it's expressed in the, the water that the plant breathes out. They're not selective, um, they're soluble in water, so that gets into the runoff and the water courses. It, they're pervasive, they're very widely used, and they're persistent in the soil. Some can last up to years in the soil. Mm -hmm. The effects of neonics, and this could be really a lot of pesticides, but the effects can either be lethal or sublethal. We've talked about some of the sublethal effects, and that the neonics compromise the bees' immune system so that they're less able to um, deal with other stressors. And again, the, the contamination can be brought into the, uh, into the hive. And it's not just bees, uh, birds are affected. Migrating birds can lose their sense of direction and you know, they need that. Um, and small amounts can kill songbirds. Um, other insects can be affected, uh, in particular the beneficial ones. But really all insects in general are, they're the basis of the food web for um, so many species that, that, we, that we know and that are part of the food chain for other species. And I think, you know, if, if you drive around, you, as a kid, I remember driving around and we would get insects on the windshield. They would, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you'd have to clean them off like once a week. And now I, I don't have, we don't have that problem. And water resources, um, you got runoff potential. And you got your aquatic invertebrates. So again, it's, sometimes it's the little things, it's the insects and the aquatic invertebrates and the soil microbes. We have to uh, be cognizant of those. Now. How did these chemicals get registered at EPA? And it turns out that they were given conditional registration, meaning that upon condition of further testing, they would be uh, released, but they were released to the market before that really happened. And um, testing for bee toxicity did not even begin until 2011. So in Connecticut, we can be proud of what the legislature did in 2016. They did pass what was called the Pollinator Health Act, and it passed unanimously, and I thought that was really great until I found out that the reason that it passed unanimously was because there were no funds for enforcement attached to it, so <laughs> that was easy enough. But there were some good things that came out of it, and one of the main things was that four of the neonics have been reclassified to restricted use, meaning that homeowners uh, cannot buy these now for grub control and things to, to spray in your yards. Um, if you have a pesticide permit, if you're a farmer, or if you're a lawn care professional, you can still buy neonics. Uh, the nurseries no longer can spray the plants which are in bloom. We would have preferred that to say, um, that they shouldn't spray the plants at all because it is uh, systemic, so it gets into the plants anyways, but it's a step in the right direction. Um, they sh uh, the Department of Agriculture will um, develop best practices for seeds treated with pesticides, and also a citizen's guide to model protection habitat will, will be developed, which has been developed, it's very nice. Uh, the DOT has greatly improved mowing procedures, I noticed along 84 last year, there are places where they, they're letting the, um, the wildflowers grow up. So that should be a big help because again, you've got pollinator habitat that's a linear, a linear strip. And some very good reports and guidelines were written. But, you know, again, there's no enforcement. Um, the, the reports were written. We don't know if the farmers are reading them or and are they following the guidelines. They're guidelines, they're not regulations. And neonics are still being used by the nurseries and pesticide applicators. 
So you may be wondering what's in your nursery plants. Uh, again, they don't, the nurseries don't have to label the plants that, are, um, that have been treated with, with neonics. So it's left to the consumer to find out. You're going to have to ask, um, you know, ask your nursery, are you using neonics? They'll probably say no. And then the next question you have to ask is, well, how about your suppliers? And they either will say, well, our suppliers don't use it, or, or they don't use it, and maybe they know, and maybe they don't. <laughs> So it's kind of, you have to know whether you trust them to be honest and informed. So with neonics being phased out, there are other pesticides that um, can become used, and some of those are pretty toxic too. Some of the old organophosphates uh, are available, and fungicides, we're, we're beginning to find out from studies that fungicides in combination with pesticides can be um, toxic to bees. And I'm using pesticides in the broad sense of the word, meaning insecticides, herbicides, rodenticides, and fungicides. <coughs> and a multiple purposes, and you can see the, the man here when he's got all these remote controls. And I think as Americans, we want to control everything, you know, so you've got a remote control for any problem that you might have. And lawns, you know, somehow we've been brainwashed to think that we have to have wide expanses of green lawns and that we have to have these chemicals that you have to buy every year and you have to put them down. And they don't stay put. Uh, many of them get washed away uh, and a lot of it gets tracked into our homes and in our cars, into our car interiors, <coughs> contaminating our drinking water. One product that, I, that we really don't recommend that you use is uh, weed and feed. It's a combination of herbicides and some of those are, are, are bad herbicides and synthetic fertilizer. And the problem is that people broadcast it over their whole lawn. They may not need herbicides over their whole lawn, so um, they're using a lot more than they should. And usually they're granular products, and that puts birds at risk because birds like granules, and that's not good for them. Um, water resources polluted, um, and these products have been banned in Canada. I always have to explain this cartoon. These cows, these cows are eating marijuana, so they're, they're weeding and feeding. <laughs> so there are some alternatives. You can build a healthy organic lawn. Um, you can use pre-emergence such as corn gluten. Um, vinegar can be used in walkways for spot treatment and good old physical intervention. <laughs> Glyphosate is the active ingredient in Roundup. It's very widely used. However, the World Health Agency uh, has declared that it's a probable carcinogen. It's a systemic and broad spectrum um, uh, herbicide. Kills many non-target, you know, organisms in the soil, earthworms, etc. Resistance over time results in super weeds, and you get a super weed, so now you need a a, a bigger hammer. You know, and now you need to add glyphosate with 2,4-D or something and, you know, it just gets to be a, a, a vicious cycle. And it's been found routinely in human urine, blood, and breast milk. Mm -hmm. And GM, there's a connection between GMOs and glyphosate because a lot of, pro, a lot of um, produce has been engineered to have, um, to be resistant to glyphosate. So the farmers, and this, this happens out west a lot with cornfields, they can plant the, the corn and then to keep the weeds down, they can spray acres and acres with glyphosate to keep the weeds down. Well, it does a couple of things. Um, those weeds, you know, and it depends on how you define weeds, but a lot of those weeds were milkweed and other weeds that were beneficial to our pollinators, so they're not there. And we know that there are studies that show that glyphosate impairs bees' navigational abilities. So, you know, herbicides can, can hurt um, insects as well as, as insecticides. So, we just have to be aware of what we're doing. And there are some serious health concerns um, related to this. We went to a seminar a couple weeks ago, Holly and I did, and it was, um, it was pretty scary when you think what's happening to our food these mm -hmm. days. It's used as a, a desiccant. What they do is, just before the wheat or the soybeans are uh, harvested, they spray it with glyphosate, which dries it out, so that makes it easier to harvest. So it's another uh, opportunity for glyphosate to be in uh, our food sources. 
And then you have your playing fields, and you probably know that in Connecticut you can't put pesticides on playing fields at the schools, but you can if it's a town-owned athletic field. And in our town, we've actually been able to get them to agree not to use neonics on the town playing fields. They're still putting down 2,4-D, but they're putting it down on spots. They're not broadcasting it. So, you know, you can talk to your town, talk to the grounds manager, see if they can adjust their ways a little bit. And golf course is also another place. And what's going on federally, you know, there's, there's so much could be said, but I, you know, they're, re they're reducing the, the funding, which means that our protection's going down, our pesticide use is going up. Um, the, I guess science is just being ignored. You know, there's still a lot of good scientists out there with, with um, very reputable scientific studies, but it's all being bypassed. You know, your policymakers are not, they're not adhering to what the science says. So there is some good news. Um, in 2016, Greenhouse Growers Survey found that 64% of nursery growers are eliminating um, neonics. So, but again, you're going to have to ask your initial, you know, your, your, your regular nursery what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And some habitat efforts, DOT, um, and I think I mentioned this, that if, if the, uh, the median is 60 feet or wider, they maintain a 15 foot buffer on either side where they just let the wildflowers grow. So um, that's good, and spot treatment for invasives. Um, and a group in Welton is developing a pollinator pathway, <laughs> which is excellent. And Ridgefield. And Ridgefield. And, and maybe Newtown, we're beginning to think about it. Um, and the Natural Resources Conservation Service is working with a lot of farmers, uh, giving them grants for planting of pollinator habitats at the farms, which, as we heard, can enhance farm production, quality, and quantity. So, you know, it makes sense. We've, we've known this. Uh, but finally we're getting around to um, recognizing it and doing something about it. And NOFA, uh, on, the, on the back table I have a couple, I have some handouts from NOFA, but they are offering a free four-week seminar for lawn care professionals to be certified for organics. And this, this would cost $700 if you were going to pay for it. So if you know of any lawn care professionals that want to take advantage of this, there's a flyer on the back um, table, and those will be held in the fall. And as stewards of our land, remember that everything is connected. Think of those small creatures. Find alternatives. Um, use that small hammer. So we all know, probably most people in this room are probably doing the right thing, but what about those neighbors? I mean, we, <laughs> we talk about this a lot, you know. Out come the little yellow signs, and, and we're like, oh, no. Um, so, you know, these two neighbors seem to be getting along, but it, it's not always so. <laughs> and your neighbor may not want a lecture from you because, you know, what do you know? So if you can just, you know, tell them everything is connected, that, that's a starting point. But then maybe give them some literature or get, or get an expert in the field um, to talk to them. And then someone had the idea to enlist their children or their grandchildren <laughs> because I think, you know, what happened with the, the smoking um, situation that, that we had 20 years ago, a lot of people gave up smoking not because um, they, they recognized that it was bad for them or there were some regulations put in place, but because their kids and their grandchildren told them, Grandma, stop smoking, so <laughs> use those kids. <laughs> and lots of information is available. Um, I think our website is, is a real good one. We have a lot of information there. And there's a, uh, many more. And I have a list of all the good websites are on the back table. And then just to, to circle around to where we started, everything is connected now. There's, there's something else on this slide that wasn't on the original one. And it's man. So we don't really think of man as being part of nature, but that's, I think that's the flaw. I think we have to realize that we are part of this whole habitat um, and the impact that we can have as man has developed, we, we are having more and more impact on nature as time goes on. And so if we see ourselves as part of the picture instead of separate from it, maybe we're more apt to respect it. And I think if we're going to be responsible about Mother Earth, we have to stay informed and use our best judgment, and that, that's sort of my, my birthday um, wish that everybody would do that. <laughs> Thank you.